Kwai Bible College, I'm pointing that direction, but they're over there and over there and over there, uh, for the great meet and greet on Friday night. That was a real blessing. Lots of fun. Our church enjoyed it. Yeah, for those of you that were able to come, it was really good. Uh, I also want to let people know that uh, Jill and Jack Kaneda uh, had their baby on Tuesday morning at like 1.30 in the morning. She was nine days, 10 days overdue. <clears throat> yep. So she had a, a 9.6 pound baby, 22 inches, 33 hours of labor. I heard that and I thought, oh, I love my wife. She went 48 hours with our first son, back labor. Yeah, it was, it was rough with bare feet, walking on hot coals. It was amazing. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, uh, really a big congratulations to Jack and Jill. Uh, their son is Benjamin Luke Kaneda, and they were going to try to make it to church today, but I don't think they quite got here. So, Jack is here? Jack, you're here? Wow, awesome. <clears throat> congratulations. And tell your wife that we're really proud of her, too. That's a, that's a, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing. We've had a few babies this, this year already in the church. Um, okay, I'd like you to turn to the book of uh, Isaiah, chapter 60. 61, and I um, want to read the text, and we have a very special service plan for you this morning. I'm praying it's going to be a blessing to, to you and your families. Isaiah 61, and we'll read the first, it's just the first three verses. That's a little windy today, losing my notes here, I got to go get them. I'm, I'm not like Bethany who can play without her music. Bethany, you're amazing. She lost one page after another after another, and no worries, she had it all memorized. I don't have my notes memorized. Okay, now I'm here. Isaiah 61, beginning in verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of gladness for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Father, we thank you for your word. And, and Father, I just want to thank you, especially this morning, that as I read that, I'm, just, I'm, I'm so thankful that you are a God that gives us good for the bad that we have, Lord, that you actually give us joy and gladness and redemption and forgiveness, and reconciliation, and new life in Christ. And I want to pray, Father, for everyone that's here today, God, that you would restore them, that you would revive them, that you would renew them as they wait on you, Lord. God, as they put their trust in you, whatever their need is, Lord, your sufficiency is more than adequate. And so we're asking today that you would bless, that you would really honor uh, this time that we've got planned, uh, that it would be a blessing for the men, the women, the families, the young boys, the young girls of this church and that it would serve to advance the cause of Christ in all of us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Uh, for the next two weeks, we are going to address the issue of sexual purity in relationship in particular to the issue of pornography. Um, I need to tell you a little bit of a backstory. This last month, Josh McDowell was here on the island. And many of you probably know him. He's one of the great uh, and foremost apologists of our century. Uh, he's a prolific author. He's written hundreds of books, hundreds of articles. Uh, he's done um, a, a great service to the kingdom of God. Once an atheist, actually working on his, on his uh, dissertation for his doctoral program in religion, his intent was to dismantle the word of God, dismantle Christianity, and prove that uh, it was all just a farce. And in the process, he became a Christian. Well, he spent the next 50 years of his life uh, promoting Christianity and providing a defense for the faith in Christ, and uh, and as he as he was speaking this last uh, this last month on Kauai, he met with the pastors and leaders, and uh, and he said that there's a, there's a, an issue that's grabbed his attention and caused him to uh, leave for the temporary period of time and probably for the rest of his life. He's in his 70s 
to leave the issue of, of, um, of apologetics as it relates to the primary focus of his ministry and to focus the balance of his life on what he considers to be the greatest threat to Christianity, which is pornography. This is what he said uh, at our meeting. He said, the plague of pornography represents one of the greatest moral challenges faced by the Christian church in the postmodern era. With eroticism woven into the very heart of the culture, celebrated in its entertainment and advertised as a commodity, it is virtually impossible to escape the pervasive influence of pornography in our culture and in our lives. I, I was quite familiar with the statistics about 10 years ago <clears throat> because I actually did a sermon series on pornography uh, just about 10 years ago. And, uh, and when I gave those statistics, uh, the statistics were shocking, they were bad. I'm gonna be sharing some of that information next week in more detail. But the thing that really captured my attention was when, um, uh, when Josh began to share that 68% 68% of Christian men, Bible-believing men, church-going men, men who have claimed the name of Christ, men who are born again, are regularly uh, viewing pornography online. 68%. The percentage of women is about half of that. These, these statistics have changed dramatically over the last 10 years. They were bad before, but now they're really bad. And what that essentially means is that, and this was... Uh, this was the uh, kind of the intent of Josh, is that you know he can be teaching apologetics for the rest of his life, but if men uh, during the week are finding themselves viewing pornography, it undermines everything. Uh, because when you view pornography, it destroys your relationship with God, it destroys your relationship with your spouse, uh, it destroys your, your impact in the community and your capacity to stand up with strength and with a sense of nobility and with godliness and with a passion for the things of God. And, uh, and a lot of men spend a, a great part of their life just trying to get clean again uh, from the last episode of having viewed pornography. And so it's my intention over these next couple of weeks to, uh, with God's help, bring this issue to the forefront right in the church. It belongs in the church because Jesus Christ spoke on these issues very directly. The Bible speaks on it directly. We're not ashamed to, uh, to deal with it directly. And we're coming at this issue, I'm coming at this issue, uh, not with a rebuke, but with the redemptive hope and promise of God. And uh, I think that, uh, at least for the men I can speak, that it's a very common problem. And uh, it's a problem that most of the men in here at one time or another, and possibly on an ongoing basis, may struggle with. But now an increasing number of women. And the really distressing uh, statistic that uh, Josh shared was that in the past, it used to be age eight and nine or so, when young men especially would find themselves drawn to pornography. Now, because of the internet connectivity that we have and the access to iPhones and tablets and computers, the new average age for young boys being exposed to pornography is four to five years old. So that's when they're seeing it. And so you can see the problem that we've got is, is really disastrous. If that is implanted in the hearts and minds of young boys in particular, but also young girls at such an early age, it, it really completely derails them. So you can understand how theology is good, and we just finished the book of Colossians that deals with false teaching, but we can, we can know the right theology, but if, if our relationship and intimacy with God is undermined by this common problem, then we're not going to get any traction as a church uh, to engage in the battle that God has us uh, engaged in as it relates to sharing the gospel and meeting the world and their needs uh, for freedom in Christ. So I want to begin by telling you that today you're going to hear a testimony from Alex and Sandy Diego. I applaud them uh, for their courage. They gave this testimony about nine years ago, and, uh, and I'll let them tell their own story. But so they're not getting up and having to do this all by themselves. I'm going to tell you my story briefly and let you know that I struggled with pornography. Uh, as a young boy. And so I'm going to tell you my story so that uh, it, it kind of paves the way for them, but also so that you know this is a very common problem. And the story I'm going to tell you is probably not different than most of the stories that would be represented here today by other people that have struggled uh, with this particular issue. My, uh, my first exposure to pornography, first of all, I grew up in a, in a Christian home. Uh, my dad worked at a church. He wasn't the pastor, but he was uh, the uh, were head of music departments in very large, large churches. And so I was in church all the time. So I didn't have a lot of exposure to pornography. But the first time, I was about maybe 10 years old. Uh, it was at Kamilawiki uh, Elementary School on the island of Oahu, where I grew up. And, uh, and some classmate of mine 
had grabbed a, a, a pornography magazine from his dad's stash, brought it to school, and there was a big commotion at recess, and everybody was huddled around this guy. I was about three people deep in it, uh, in, in looking over shoulders, and didn't know what it was, and then suddenly I saw, you know, pornography. And that was my first exposure. But I had more, more uh, exposure uh, shortly after that, my dad uh, rode motorcycles, and so he got motorcycle magazines. And in motorcycle magazines, they're, they're scantily clad women, and they'd be draped over the motorcycles. And it doesn't take uh, much for a little 10-year-old boy to get his engines revving, you know? And so that's all it took. And I want to let you know that, especially for you ladies, that you, you're, you may not be kind of thinking like that, and, and I know sometimes it's a little hard to, you know, accept that this is a, a challenge for the average guy that even like Macy's circulars when you're a little boy, uh, you know, when the Victoria's Secret catalog comes in your mail and you think, oh, I want, oh, that'd be cute to order that, and you've got a young boy in your house, that's just, that's just deadly. Uh, so it doesn't take a lot. And that kind of began a, 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 a process for me in my teens where um, I lived near Waikiki and it didn't happen very often. And because I was a Christian, at least a professing Christian. I wasn't really walking with the Lord, but I knew right from wrong. And when I had some experience in pornography, I would feel terrible. I would be convicted. I would feel ashamed. And I would repent and ask God to forgive me. And I would be good for maybe two or three months. And then I'd have another opportunity. Something would happen, some exposure, uh, some, something I would see in the supermarket, uh, on the magazine rack, uh, or even as you're just checking out. And, and I remember... Uh, uh, I'm not uh, proud of this, but it was what happened, is that uh, I'd find myself in some, you know, just like an ABC store in the magazine rack, and I'd be looking, and I'd, I'd be trolling, looking for pornography. And I couldn't stay in any one place too long because, you know, the, the people are watching me, you know, at the counter, and they know what I'm doing. So I'm there for like five minutes, and then I move on, go to another place. I could spend like an hour or two doing that, walking through Waikiki. And it was, it was really, uh, you know, I'd, after I'd, I'd feel so disgusted with myself and I'd make another new commitment that I would never do that again. Uh, and then I'd run, I remember one day going down to the bottom of our, of our condo complex and uh, going down to the trash chute to take a big bulky item that my parents wanted me to get rid of. I go down there and there's a stack of Playboys down there and I'm like 13 years old and I'm by myself in this room and I'm making a, a decision about what to do. And, uh, and so I made a decision to take a copy and I stashed it up at our house, you know? And, and that struggle went on until I was about 17. And at 17, I, that was a point where I really made a commitment to Christ, and I, and I knew that part of my commitment to Christ had to be an end to, to doing what I was doing, which wasn't like every day, but it was like every few months that I'd kind of binge. And I was disgusted with it, I didn't like it, I felt uh, it damaged my walk with God, it damaged my walk with my family, with myself. I, it was just, uh, it was really, you know, you guys know what it feels like. And so um, I was kind of in that place that Paul was in in Romans 7 where he says, you know, the things that I don't want to do, I end up finding myself doing. And the things that I do want to do, I don't do. And, and Paul is crying out in, in that section of Scripture and said, who will deliver me from the body of this death? And he says, thanks be to God that we have the victory in Christ. And Christ does bring the victory. So next week I'm going to be talking about things that, that help transform my life and set me free. Uh, from pornography and, and things that I still have in place because I'm still a man and I'm still completely capable of, of falling in that area. And so there's a whole series of things that I do that are parameters and protectors that, build, that I built around my life through accountability and, uh, and just cutting off the source of pornography that has completely set me free and ended the battle for me. It's not that the battle's not possible, it's just that I don't have access. And because of that, I'm free. And I don't have to worry about it. And I'm not fighting it anymore. And so I'm going to be sharing about that next week. So I want to encourage you to bring uh, your family. Uh, we have, the, uh, I think, the junior high uh, Sunday school classes in church today to hear this because that's right in an age group where they're struggling as well and challenged. And, uh, uh, and I want to be a blessing. We're not condemning anybody. We want men set free, women set free. We want families free of pornography. We want the body of Christ free from pornography so that we can have strength and power and zeal and passion for the things of God so that we can make a difference in this day and age in which we live. So without uh, further ado, I want to invite Alex and Sandy to come forward. Uh, they've been in this church for, I think, about 15 years or so. And, uh, and I asked them many years ago, 
uh, when they had had a struggle in this particular arena, if they would be willing to share their testimony. And, uh, and, and they were not only willing, but they were transparent and honest and open. And they do it for you and for the kingdom of God and to give God glory for what he's delivered them from and how he's helped them. So I'd like to have you uh, welcome with me Alex and Sandy Diego. Can you... Good morning, everybody. Everybody's going, oh, I, th I think I know what he's going to talk about this morning. <laughs> well, thank you, Bob, for that introduction, and thank you for sharing. Uh, it takes a lot of courage, especially coming from a pastor, to uh, share what he experienced as a child, and uh, it takes a lot of humility, and I, I applaud you for that, Bob. Not a, not a lot of people stand up here and share and bear all and uh, we appreciate that. Uh, you know, I was exposed to pornography at a very young age myself. Uh, I shared last night, uh, I was about five, maybe five, six, it doesn't really matter, it was very young. Uh, and uh, it was through uh, my brother, he had some magazines uh, that he stashed under his bed, and lo and behold, I found it. And so I was exposed to that at an early age. And uh, I was astounded that, you know, at, at such a young age that, you know, that we gravitated to that. I gravitated to that. And, uh, you know, I was just shocked. But, you know, as I grew older, it, you know, it became part of my life. And as I reflect on my childhood, you know, it, it really struck a core because... It, it, when a child is exposed at a very young age like that, it's seared into their conscience. It's hard to get over it because those things are imprinted in their frame of mind, in their thought, and it's hard to break from that cycle. And so it followed me from that very young age into my adolescent years, into high school. You know, it, it just, it was a repetitive cycle in my life that I could never shake off. And I follow, it followed me into my early adulthood. Uh, at the age of 17, I enlisted and, and uh, went into the Marine Corps. I served four years. And, you know, at that stage in life, you know, 18, 19, it became predominant in my life. You know, you got a whole bunch of young Marines going out on liberty, especially in, in all parts of the world. I was stationed in Asia. And, gosh, the, the things that we saw, the things that, you know, we experienced, uh, you know, I don't like to even go into it. It, it was bad. And, uh, you know, I wasn't a Christian then, so I really couldn't uh, say I was going to hell because I, I wasn't a believer at the time. I think, you know, life was going to go on its merry way, and I was fine with it because the world uh, looks at it as, as being okay. You know, you have these expert psychologists say, you know, this this, this works. You need to, to look at this material because it relieves you from stress. It, it, it enhances your life. No, it doesn't. It destroys your life. It strips the fiber. Every fiber of your being, your whole core, gets destroyed. And that's what was happening to me. You know, bit by bit, piece by piece, the more I viewed this material, the less of me existed. The more of, of the enemy started to, to take hold of my life. And... Uh, during that time in my life, uh, back in uh, 91, 90, 1990, 1991, for some of you, you weren't even born yet, the kids, uh, that's when I met my wife. We were, uh, I was stationed in New Orleans, and my wife was in the Naval Reserves, and uh, we met at uh, the Marine Corps Ball. A friend of mine introduced me to her. Uh, she was his date. <laughs> and... Uh, And I, and I, uh, she he said, well, do you want to meet her? I said, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll meet your friend. So we went to the table, and uh, it's like, oh, hey, hey, Sandy, this is my friend Alex, and this is Sandy, my date, you know, and my friend. And I said, oh, I said, hi, and she goes, uh, oh, save me a dance. And I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. I'm like, why, why is she asking me to save a dance for her? She's already with somebody, you know? It's like, it's like okay, sure, I'll save you a dance. So, but, you know, I, I had no intention of going and, 
and, and dancing with her because she came with somebody else. I wasn't going to interfere with somebody's, somebody's date, but she came looking for me afterwards. I said, where's that dance? <laughs> and, and lo and behold, 25 going on 26 years later, we, you know, we've been married that long, tw going on 26 this year. But, uh, you know, when I, when I met her, I thought, wow, this is going to change my life. I'm, uh, this cycle of pornography, this cycle of immoral being uh, is going to go away. You know, I thought this was the savior that I needed and that all this destructive, immoral behavior that I was experiencing w was going to be gone. But that, that was just fake. You know, it, it was great for a, a few months of, and then I was back to that same cycle again, back on that wheel, that spinning wheel, that ever-revolving wheel. And it, it was destructive. And then we moved up, after I got out of the Marine Corps, we moved back to Kauai uh, after, in 1991, and my wife soon followed back in 94. And, uh, you know, I was still on that crazy cycle of pornography off and on. I, was, I still wasn't a believer. And then, uh, I guess the fall of 1999 going into 2000 I was in a in a crisis mode and uh, I was doing methamphetamine at the time and I, I just was at rock bottom I really hit rock bottom at, the, at that time and I was crying out to the Lord Lord help me I, I need to change my lifestyle and you know I confessed to Sandy that I was battling uh, a drug addiction and, uh, you know, she, she was distraught because I was a functional addict. You know, I was still getting the bills paid, still paying my taxes. I was taking care of everything that I needed to do. But, but I was just destroying my life with drugs and alcohol. And so I confessed to her, and then, you know, she, she forgave me. And then that year, uh, spring of 2000, uh, I accepted Christ. As my Lord and Savior, it was at one of our uh, Easter, Easter programs that we had on the beach. We used to hold Easter over at Lidgate by the Heiau over there. That's just below Kauai Beach Resort. And uh, uh, my good friend over there in the back, Dana Nadell, he was doing the message. And he was preaching about the covenants of God. And then he talked about the new covenant, which is in Christ Jesus. And, and I, that message just struck me. You know, I wanted to... to end this destructive lifestyle I was leading and accept the grace of God and, and accept Christ into my life. And, and I accepted Jesus that day. And uh, I did it quietly. I didn't, I didn't vocalize it to a lot until I got back home. And I told my wife and, and my two daughters that were with us that morning that I accepted Christ that day. And, and they were just so blown away. And, and uh, you know, but drug, drugs were out of my life at the time, but pornography was still in. You know, you know how we, we give up certain things but still hang on to some. Well, I gave up drugs, but I was still hanging on to pornography. And so, I'll, you know, after so many times of my wife catching me uh, on the, the history, you know, your, pro, your computer has history uh, on where you've been, on all the websites. And so after the umpteenth time, she uh, stumbled upon uh, sites that I've been to, you know, I, she... It, literally broke the camel's back. She was done with it. She was so far gone. She, she literally was checking out of our marriage. She said, you know what? I'm done. You need help. If you don't get help, I'm out of here. And so, you know, I didn't want to lose my wife. I didn't want to destroy all what uh, I believed in. You know, I didn't believe in pornography. I believed in the, the tangible things of life. My wife, my kids, that was very important to me. And so I, I told her, yes, I'll seek help. And she goes, you need to go see Bob. You need to you know, make this right. And I remember that, that morning, uh, we just got done blacktopping this property up here where, you know, that we're standing on today, sitting down today. And uh, Bob and, and some of the other leaders were up here. They were praying that morning. It was a Wednesday morning. And so I, I approached him. They just got done wrapping up that morning prayer. And and uh, I, was, I was scared. I was like, man, how am I going to come up and share something that I'm struggling with, uh, you know, to, to my pastor? You know, I was like, gosh, man, I'm so embarrassed. What is he going to think of me? You know, so, but I, I was like, I can't hold back. I got I to gotta tell him. So I, 
I came up to him right after they were done and say, hey, Bob, I got something to tell you. Uh, my wife's leaving me and, and because I'm, I'm hooked on pornography. I need help. And the thing that really struck me was uh, how Bob uh, accepted me. He said, you know, Alex, uh, I'm not going to throw any stones. I know what you're going through. I know how you feel. And it really comforted me that I had a pastor who uh, understood what I was going through, understood what a, a man has to go through, and he was willing to help. And so my wife and I went to him for about a month, two months of, of marriage counseling. And uh, every time we uh, came in to our morning meetings, or whenever our meetings were, he would always ask us, uh, you know, what were we from a number one to ten? And I would be like seven, you know, and, and he would ask Sandy, and, and she would always lowball the number. She'd, she'd go two, three. I'm like, gosh, man, I need, some, <laughs> I need some help here. But, you know, I, I understood, you know, when you uh, destroy the self-esteem of your wife, Strip her of that loyalty that she feels for you. What do you expect? A 10? And I'm glad it was a 2 or a 3 and not a 0, you know, in retrospect. Because I, I destroyed uh, that, that connection that we had through my immoral behavior. And so, you know, I got tired of living that life that Bob was sharing, uh, Romans chapter 7. You know, the things that I do want to do, I don't do, and the things that I do not want to do those I do. You know, that's the, that's the life I was living, you know, living and carrying out. You know, wanting to do good, but yet struggling and doing the evil that persists. And I was a Christian now. So I was like, how can I live a life like this and still claim to be a Christian? You know, First John says, if, if, if the truth is not in you, then you're, you're not a believer. If you claim to be a believer in the truth that's not in you, you're lying. And so right there, I knew that it was a battle for my soul. It is a battle for a soul. And, and I had to make a choice. Do I want to die and live apart from Christ forever? Or do I want to live or die to myself and live with Christ I chose to die to myself, and I needed to make sure that Sandy understood that uh, a life living in this immoral way w was not how I wanted to live. And so I made that commitment, and we kept seeing Bob. We, uh, he, Bob introduced us to a couple of books that uh, really helped us in, in, our, in our strategy and in our in our walk in, in dealing with this, this uh, situation. Uh, the books are entitled, uh, for the men, it's uh, uh, Every Man's Battle. And for the women, it's entitled uh, Every Heart Restored. Uh, you know, if, if you're dealing with this issue, uh, I highly recommend these books. For, for the men, uh, Every Man's Battle is, is an eye-opener. It's very revealing. And it gives you a, a great... Uh, list of strategies on how to uh, protect yourself and limit yourself uh, in, in, in dealing with this situation. Limit yourself as far as exposure is concerned and setting up parameters and, and defenses in order to protect you and your family. And, you know, there's a lot at stake. And, you know, it wasn't just about me. When you view pornography, you think, oh, it's, it's, a, it's a victimless crime. It's not. There's so much people affected by it. If you're married, your wife. If you have kids, you have your sons and daughters. They all get impacted by this tremendously. And, you know, I know it impacted uh, my children as well, and especially my youngest daughter, who, you know, took it real hard, because Sandy's going to share later on on what she told her, but, you know... It was difficult for them. They may not have shown, uh, you know, how distressed they were out front to me, but I'm sure they were dealing with it very hard. And so I had to make it right. And so we went through this, the, these books and then, you know, going through God's Word. That, that was the saving grace is you have to understand and formulate a battle plan. 
You know, all these books that people write is one thing. You know, that's great and fine and dandy, but the truth and the power lies in the Word of God. And so we need to be in the Bible, and, and that's where we were. We were constantly reading. We were constantly praying, you know, because we can't do it on our own. You know, you watched the video earlier, the promo on the Conquer series. You know, if you think you can do it on your own and just say, oh, I need to be stronger, you know, that, that's the lie from the enemy. You need to be in God's Word. You need to be in fellowship, and you need to be in prayer, and you need to be committed. And so I, 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 I was committed, and I still am committed. You know, through the years, you know, we, we understood that, uh, well, let me go back a little bit. You know, I recall when Bob asked us to share this about 10 years ago, I was so reluctant. It's like, you know, it's one thing to, to share it to your pastor. It's another thing to share it in, in front of a, a wide body of people like this, or even greater at times. Uh, it's difficult. But I know that, you know, I've been crucified with Christ. It's, it is no longer I that lives in me, but Christ. And I took that to heart. You know, we've been bought out of price. Uh, we're soldiers in the battlefield. It's like what Dana shares a lot. We're, we're, uh, we're expendable. And so I can't focus in on... on me and being self-centered anymore. I have to realize that there's other people out there that are struggling, that are dealing with the same thing that I've dealt with. And regardless of my fear and sharing, it's too important to hold it back. And so that was, that was the overcoming part, overcoming that fear and, and, and coming out and sharing that. And it's broke, really broken uh, the hold that the enemy has on me and released me. Because it's no longer I, don't longer, I don't longer have that shame anymore because it's not about me anymore. It's just too important to hold it in. And so we, we've done a lot of, of uh, classes in the years and then other studies to help other people uh, cope with this. You know, currently we're doing some marriage uh, videos called Love and Respect that Sandy and I have been doing for the last five years or so. Uh, Another study that we've done in the past was, um, is that The Exceptional Wife? The Excellent Wife and, what's that other book? Excellent Husband. That's a longer, longer series. But, you know, we, we see the need for, for uh, healing in families and in marriages. And that's the desire that God has put in our hearts. Uh, it's not easy. Like Bob said, we always need to be wary. We always need to be uh, cautious of, of where we are, know your limitations, and always be on guard because we're so susceptible. You know, I can't, we're capable of doing some of the most horrendous things in this, in this world. And so I need to guard myself. You all need to guard yourself and, and, and uh, just trust in God. And that's what I've been doing. It hasn't been easy. You know, I, I need to die to myself daily, as Paul has said. And so, I do that daily. And uh, it, I love my wife. She's, she's got a story to tell and a story to share with you. Uh, I hope it helps some of the women here who have had relationships uh, or are in a relationship with a partner who, who's dealing with these issues. And she can share how she's handled it. Uh, she's been gracious. She's been awesome. Here she is. She's going to share. Well, good morning. He's a hard act to follow, but I'll do my best. Okay. Um, every love story is a beautiful one, but ours is my favorite because it comes with forgiveness and redemption. On August 30th, 2016, we celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary, as he said earlier. And I tell you this because it's a celebration that almost wasn't. You see, for years, I had been in a spiritual battle for my marriage and for myself, and it was taking a toll. If you can imagine love as a gas tank, I was sitting on empty. My marriage problem wasn't like any type of marriage problem. It was about the most intimate aspect of marriage, sexuality. For you see, pornography had been a part of my marriage for 14 out of 25 years. 
I had gone through all the different aspects of the, mer of the presentations, the magazines, the videos, even on TV, and the computer. And each time, I was always promised this would be the last time. Satan used this to his advantage. First, I took on Alex Sin as my own. It was my fault he was this way. I felt like a failure as a woman, as a lover, and as a companion. Maybe if I was more of a woman, then he wouldn't need the magazines or the videos or even the computer. He also used his fear of other people's judgments. I mean, who was I going to tell? I couldn't go to my pastor. He's a man. How could I go tell him that my husband was in pornography? I couldn't confide in any female friends or even family members. I mean, what would they think or say? It's only pictures, right? And then I was afraid to leave for fear of being a failure in my, the eyes of my children. So I began to develop my own coping mechanisms to deal with the pain. I focused on school. I had to be the honor student. I had to be the 4.0. I focused on serving in church. I said yes to everything. Need a volunteer? I was there. Finally, there was a temptation to prove myself to myself and to Alex that I was a person that could be loved and that I was worth it. And if it wasn't to Alex, then to someone else. But at the same time, I feared what that would bring. I mean, I love Alex, and I, I couldn't imagine my life without him, but I couldn't continue this life with him. After one of the exposures and confrontations, our youngest daughter came to me, and she was very angry. She was angry at both of us. But to me, she said, why do you put up with this? Why don't you just leave him? He's just using you as a doormat. Once more, Satan used deception. Now I begin to think, to stay in this marriage and be in this marriage, I was a failure in the eyes of my children. It was at that moment, feeling physically, emotionally, and spiritually drained, that I did something that I've never done before. I put a condition on my love and my marriage. I told Alex that this is it. I can't do this anymore. If I find any more pornography in the house, then I'm going to leave. On December 2nd, 2005, I was working on a paper for class. And when I went online to do some research, of course, down dropped a list of porn sites. So I confronted Alex about it. At first, he denied it. He said he hadn't gone to the sites. Then he tried to convince me that it was my fault that he was at the sites. I continued to press until finally he admitted that he had been looking at the porn. At that instant, I emotionally left my husband. I disappeared to plan the physical leaving, which would follow shortly. The next morning, however, I woke up with plenty of anger. I had had 14 years that had been bottled up, and I wasn't backing down, nor was I going to be quiet. Alex asked would I go to counseling with him. I agreed, but not for the right reasons. I was going to counseling just to make it more difficult for him. I wanted him to suffer the same way that I had suffered. Besides, it would help and look good if I could say that we had gone to counseling and it didn't work. At our very first meeting with Pastor Bob, he asked how I felt. And so I told him, I feel angry. I feel betrayed. I feel hurt. I feel shame. I feel crushed. Then he asked me, had I forgiven Alex? And I said, no. And I thought to myself, nor am I going to. He said something that just kind of snapped for me. He said, you know, Alex is created in the image of God and you need to forgive him. And he was right. You know, Jesus says, if you forgive men when they have sinned against you, then your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men of their sins, then your heavenly Father will not forgive your sins. So I needed to forgive Alex. He gave me a book uh, to read called Every Heart Restored. And as I started my reading as soon as we got in the car, the book and the workbook helped to validate my feelings of what I was feeling about myself. It helped me to understand that it wasn't about me. It also gave me guidance to heal my marriage and myself. 
It taught me how to experience anger in a righteous way and how to move towards forgiveness. But most importantly, it was the prayer and my seeking God to guide me and provide me with the answers through his word. Using the words of the psalmist, I learned to be still and know God. Matthew 10, 39, Jesus tells us that if you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life, you will find it. In this battle, I had to learn in order to pick up God's shield, I would need to lay down my own. And this would not be easy because the world tells me, take care of number one, me. But the Christian, the Christianity says to align my thinking with Christ. And in regards to my marriage, as a wife, the best way would be to come alongside my husband and help him along. By forgiving Alex, I began to detach myself from my own guilt and shame. I learned through this process that God's grace is ultimately the best cure for this debilitating shame. For it takes away the two things that give shame its power, rejection and abandonment. God's grace wraps us in unconditional love and acceptance. As a playwright, Eugene O'Neill once wrote, man is born broken. He lives by mending. Grace is the glue. So you see, it is not Alex and Sandy standing before you, but two vessels being used by God. There are too many lives and marriages being destroyed by Satan. It is our hope and prayer that what we have shared can break this deception, the lies that Satan has bound upon those trapped in this type of sin. Thank you. Uh, isn't she great? She stuck with me through thick and thin. I love you, dear. You know, as I said, I, I totally destroyed her self-esteem and, and her loyalty to me, you know. And so, but God, I like that, but God has restored that. And we've reconciled. It, you know, it took a while. You know, when, when you go through that type of ordeal, it's not going to be a cakewalk. It's not going to happen overnight. And I had to get used to that. You know, it took months. You know, there'll be some good days and there'll be some bad days. And, uh, but I always look forward to the good ones. <laughs> you know, guys, uh, and some gals, it's so important to place parameters in life, and especially with, with sexual immorality. You know, computers... Man, if, if you have a computer at home and it's unlocked, you don't have a, a password protected against these sites, uh, you're at risk. So I, I, I urge you to, to put a block on your computers at home so that that temptation, like Bob was sharing, doesn't exist. You know, access is, is a huge part. If access is available, it's going to be utilized. It will be. So you need to cut access out. Another one is, is who, what's relatively available today? You know, cell phones, as Bob was sharing earlier with Josh McDowell, 68% uh, of, of churchgoers. Men, that's huge, 70%. That's everyday Christians that come to church, sit next to you, read the Bible, yet when they're at home alone, they're viewing these things. That's scary. Think about it. What's going to happen with our future generation if it, doesn't, if it doesn't get addressed? So I urge you, if you have un unprotected computers or, or cell phones, put a block on it, please. Don't allow access. I used to grumble and complain about my, to my wife and say, oh, but it's going to inhibit me from viewing these other sites. Big deal. You know, you have to say big deal. Your, your relationship and your marriage is way more important. And so I urge you guys to do that, you know, for, for the sake of not only you, but for your family, because it affects your kids and future generations. And, and like I said, when it's seared into the conscience of a, of a child growing up, 
Think of how it's going to happen as it works through your life. Like I said, I was exposed at five. It did tremendous damage. It took a lot to get it out of me, to purge it out of me. I still struggle in my mind. And so I, I have to be aware of what my limitations are and what I need to do. That's always going to be there. You know, anything can happen. And I don't want it to happen. So I have these parameters uh, surrounding me to make sure that I'm safe. So, uh, you know, I thank you guys for, for being here and being able to listen to what we shared today. Uh, it's not easy, you know, burying open, you know, some of most, your most intimate uh, things that you've done in your life. It, it's scary, very scary. But, uh, you know, men, I urge you guys to come uh, Monday nights to our uh, men's fellowship while this video is going to be happening next it's not going to happen Monday. It's going to be the following Monday. Uh, it's going to be a great, great video series. I saw some of it. Bob texted me the, the link, and I checked it out, and I was like, wow, this is pretty cool. So I urge you guys to come out. We're still going to have our same format, potluck or something like that, right, Bob? And then watch the video, and then probably have a few discussions afterwards. You know, but, you know, we don't want to stigmatize anybody. Even if you're not dealing with any of this, come. Come anyway, because the more... Uh, you know, the better you can protect yourself and the better you can protect friends and family, you know. So thank you guys again. God bless you. Here, here's the really cool thing, the redemption, where God takes brokenness and he heals and does wonderful things. And the little clip, you know, the video clip that, uh, where the, the main speaker says he, he got sweet revenge. What's his revenge? He, he takes an area of absolute failure in his own life and he turns it and uses that as a weapon against the enemy. And that's what Alex and Sandy have done. And, uh, and they're, they're very involved in church. This all, I think this all happened in like 2007 or something Six, like that. Yeah. Six and seven. And, uh, and since that time, Sandy's just been such a fruitful person in the church. And while Ray was away uh, for her grandbabies on the mainland, she took up sports camp. She was head of our children's program. Uh, she headed up our dramas for Easter and, and Christmas. And she's just very, very, you know, committed to Christ. And Alex, simultaneously, God started raising him up. And, and though he has a past like we all have, uh, God raised him up, and now he's one of the pastors in our church. He got ordained a number of years ago. He's been solid. He's, he's got courage. He's, uh, he knows the word of God. He knows doctrine. He's able to really help a lot of guys. And a lot of men in our church have a, well, all the men in our church have a great deal of respect for Alex and for Sandy. And I just want to say personally thank you for being such great examples of a couple that, uh, that took the brokenness of what the enemy was doing in your life and you actually are getting sweet revenge. And they've led so many Bible studies, couples Bible studies. They, they head up our couples ministry. Uh, in our church, they, they, uh, we host Love and Respect here. They're leading it. We have people from the community coming to Love and Respect on a regular basis here in our church under their leadership. And they're investing back in helping other couples be successful in the way that God has helped them to be successful. So I want to say thank you for your courage and your openness. I want to pray for them and for our church. Father, just thank you for this morning. And I thank you so much for Alex and Sandy. Uh, Becky and I love them. We respect them. We honor them. Uh, we're delighted at how you've raised them up in leadership and how they're under shepherding the flock of God. And they're getting sweet revenge uh, in a variety of areas, God, like we all are. We're coming back with the redemptive work of God in our life and we're turning it against the enemy and we're turning it for the kingdom of your dear son. And so we wanna say thank you, Lord, for being a God who redeems. Thank you that you're redemptive. Thank you that you don't give up on us. Thank you that you don't throw us away. But God, you look for ways and avenues, especially through your son Christ, to bring about reconciliation, redemption, renewal, and new life. And we want to say thank you for the men and women of this church and the young boys and the young girls, God. And I pray that you'd set us free as a congregation, that uh, though the statistics are daunting, that we would have success, Lord, that you'd give us favor. And for those that are caught and trapped and, and enslaved in some way to pornography, Father, I pray that you'd set them free. And the beginning would be just the openness and the willingness to confess, the willingness to, 
to be transparent, the willingness to get help, the willingness to open their mouth and say, I'm struggling and I need some friends. And so God, I pray that you do that in this fellowship and that we'd, be, we'd just be packed out uh, for these Monday night men's groups that start two weeks from now. And uh, that men would come, they'd bring their friends, they'd bring their coworkers, they'd bring their, their, their nephews, their friends, people, God, that, uh, that are struggling and there would be redemption and freedom and new life for all of us that uh, participate. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Can you thank them one more time for doing this? Really appreciate you, you guys are amazing. Totally a blessing. I love you, man, thank you. We are going to complete our service with communion.